Thessalonians chapter 6. And then I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just two verses. And really, this first one is we're really just going to look at a couple of words all together. A total between the two verses is going to be a total of seven words. All right. So I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, the first part first, and then I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. It says this in verse 10, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 the first in a series of commands that are given to close out the epistle, rejoice evermore. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly love you. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I ask for your blessing upon the message tonight, Lord, even even just a special touch that you would work and use this to strengthen our church to draw us closer to you. I pray, Lord, that you would control what I say and how I say it. Lord, I certainly, I, I know that I need you. I know that I need your mercy and grace. And Lord, I pray that you'd help this to minister and to be a help, Lord, to your people. So, Lord, I, I pray that you would do just that tonight. Uh, please use this for your honor and glory. And uh, Lord, I love you and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> the church in Thessalonica, we know, of course, about the church in Corinth and the problems that they had. Paul, in, in, in context of chapter 6, was referencing his life and what things he was going through. And he made that statement as sorrowful yet rejoicing. And then verse 16 of uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice evermore. We have went through the book of Acts. We understand that This command that is given is given to a church, especially at a time, at the probably one of the most difficult times that this church was facing. And when he's given this series of commands, the very first one he gives is to rejoice evermore. After the Apostle Paul started this church in Thessalonica, remember, that's that's a that's a city about the size of Anchorage, the capital of Macedonia called the mother of Macedonia, and this, this uh, amazing place on that trade route, a key city. Paul starts the church there, but as we know, the Jews caused an uproar with the whole town. Uh, a riot just about ensues. Paul and Silas are ran out of town, even to a point from the leaders of the church where Paul is not allowed to return to that town. It's not long after that that 1 Thessalonians is written. Paul is so worried because he knows the suffering, the persecution, the trials that they're going through, and Paul would write this letter to them. He sends this letter back to them, and he tells them right here in our text to rejoice evermore. Paul expected them to rejoice in spite of their circumstances and difficulties. I need you to hear me out tonight. I need you to listen to this. There is something to the Lord's joy during difficult circumstances. We're not talking about being happy. We're talking about the joy of the Lord is our strength. There's something to this. There's something to the joy of the Lord being your strength when your world has changed. Just like when Steve got that call on the road to come back to the office. And Steve and Lori going back there and knowing what their own son-in-law had to let them know. The world changed. They're certainly not the only one in our church who has gotten a call like that when an event has taken place and your world has changed. Multitudes in here that I can think of. I can think, of course, even the McDonald's going back before they got here and getting a call how, how their son was losing his eyesight. To getting to Alaska and finding out the disease that he actually had. Your world changed. to 
my son getting a call or troopers showing up at the door. The world changed. Those moments happen. The context of 1 Thessalonians is a church that is under tremendous suffering, trials, and difficulty. And when he goes into this series here of these important verses, he starts off with, Rejoice evermore! But how is that possible? How is that even possible? You better understand the joy of the Lord. We're, we're so used to just the happenstance and the happiness or joy of the world that we lack such understanding and we don't even see the need that we have for joy of the Lord in our life, especially, especially during trying times. You don't have to be given a command to rejoice evermore when everything's going well. You have to be given the command when your world falls apart. Two words. Rejoice evermore. Two words that at times all of us think, I can't possibly follow that. But yes, you can. As Christians, yes, we can. And I need to make the case for that. We see this command throughout Scripture. I'm not going to turn there for time's sake. It's already going on 8 o'clock, but you need to hear this message. Philippians chapter 4 uh, we, we have the Apostle Paul, um, rejoice, uh, 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 rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he, that the first few words, commanding the church to rejoice. As Christians, we greatly need the joy of the Lord. To be able to put self aside to get to that place where this takes place, where it can actually make a difference in your life. It gives us strength when it's needed. Nehemiah chapter 8 even deals with that. It helps you continue, it helps you endure. And boy, even with stuff going on, you know, you know, it's true. You think about this. Joy is contagious, as is sadness for that matter. I mean, when you're around somebody who's always gloomy and always down, it's going to have an effect on you. I just preached at a teen camp on the autopsy of a dead Christian. Being around somebody who's gloomy is like watching an autopsy. But also as contagious as somebody who's joy, who has joy uh, abounding. How many of you know Brother Doug Duff had ever met him? Is that not contagious? Honestly, I have never met a Christian with just more continuous joy. And it's contagious. The truth is, before we got saved, we were commanded to repent. And now after salvation, we are commanded to rejoice. And the command is needed when it's difficult, not when everything's going well. The structure of the words in 1 Thessalonians 5 has the meaning to rejoice at all times. Some might say, but we have verses like Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with them that do weep, and that certainly is true. Those verses are not talking about the internal necessity of the joy of the Lord in our life on a daily basis, but that is a verse that is so important of us being able to show empathy and compassion for others, to weep when they weep and rejoice when they rejoice. At times we think the two can be mutually exclusive to rejoice and to weep, but they are not. Not when it comes to the joy of the Lord. Think what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, what Paul said, as sorrowful 
yet always rejoicing. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I like what one commentator or pastor said of that verse. He said this, even when he, speaking of the life of the Apostle Paul is the context of this. Even when he was sorrowing, sorrowing with the sorrow of others, sorrowing over the failure of believers in the churches, sorrowing over the disaffection of those he loved, sorrowing over the pain of persecution in his own life, sorrowing uh, uh, more often than not over the maltreatment that the gospel preachers received, sorrowing over the dishonor, uh, it goes on and on, sorrowing over all that he endured. Sorrowing over the dishonor that was also placed upon Christ. And yet all of those kinds of emotional experience never touched his joy. So he could in truth say as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. It was his strength. So I think to be able to understand that we need to look at it from three perspectives tonight. When, how, and what. Again, if you think about it, let's look at the when. The only time that we need the command to rejoice is when things are tough. When you get that phone call. So you're saying, Pastor, that, that I can be sorrowful, yet there should be some rejoicing. It's exactly what I'm saying. You need to understand this. It will be your strength. I'm not talking about pretending nothing's going on. Not at all. Not for a second. Yet sorrowful, uh, but, but always rejoicing. The truth is we see this throughout Scripture. If you think of John chapter 13 through 17, which is the last discourse of the teaching and preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ that he gives to the disciples before his arrest. Before he is to be crucified. Of the difficulty they were struggling with of, of him even seeing the, 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 the suffering and, and, and the, the, the angst that they were going through. Giving us great chapters like John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. He speaks of joy over and over in those chapters. When Jesus comes to the end of the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, when he does deal with, with the ability to rejoice, it was always in the context of suffering, like when you're being persecuted. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, I rejoice in my sufferings. Again, the book of Philippians, one of my favorite books, Joy is mentioned 16 times in 102 verses. And when you think of the context of the book, again, incredible. Man facing death at the time he wrote it. We looked at Sunday night, James chapter 1 and verse 2. To consider it all joy when trials hit. We talked about that Sunday night to count, know, and let. It's in times of great adversity and great trials that we are called as Christians to remember who we are and not allow it to steal the joy of the Lord because it is our strength. But how? How can we rejoice? How can we have joy in the midst of sorrow? Again, this is not about the Lord trying to get you to pretend nothing's wrong. That's not it at all. He's actually showing us how to handle adversity. You see, because the joy of the Lord and the joy that the Word of God is speaking of in context here is much different than the world's joy. 
The majority of us, even saved people, our experience in life rest when it comes to joy and happiness is really only what we know in the world. The joy of the Lord is not dependent upon circumstances. This joy is so much different than the world's joy. The world's joy comes after you basically follow the desires of your heart. Those don't necessarily have to be sinful. I mean, many times obviously are because our heart is desperately wicked. But nonetheless, they don't have to be sinful. You, you, how it works from a natural, carnal standpoint within this world, and only joy the world knows that, that there's something that your heart desires or wants. If you follow it, if you obtain it, there's going to be a sense of joy. You experience happiness. You see something you want, you have the funds to buy it, you buy it. You experience a sense of joy, a sense of happiness. You set expectations for something and they're met, you find happiness. When it's in a relationship, goals, whatever it might be. This is the world's joy. But many times, many times, the world's joy is delusional and sad in itself. Listen, don't miss this. I want to try to get to see how you can see how you can be joyful apart from all those circumstances. I remember that one of the principles of this, I began to understand, I'm, I'm not a big bluegrass guy, I don't give it wrong, but it was going back when I was in Korea, there was a song that was a, a bluegrass called Money Treasures Can't Buy. Basically dealt with the essence of that. Somebody was poor in the writing of it, um, but thought how wealthy he really was. Caleb, I know you know that song. Don't you be talking about it right now. I know you do. Don't you do it. The book of Ecclesiastes deal with the del- that we went through really dealt much of it dealt with the delusional aspect of the world's joy, the vanity of life. That regardless of what you can obtain, what pleasures you can find, that the time always comes when you're left empty. You see, as Christians, we're in such a different realm. I mean, think of the rich man that, that, that the Lord talked about with building his barns and his bigger barns and was so thrilled with all of life. He had a sense of joy, but he was a fool. His soul would be required of him and all that would change. His joy was actually delusional and misplaced. What that man should have had, regardless of his circumstances with how great everything was going, was sorrow unto repentance. The joy that the world offers that we are so accustomed to is only temporary. It's not satisfying. That's why so many Christians can be such massive roller coasters. You might need to listen to this. What we're, how we're used to experiencing joy is, is it follows the, the way of the world, the way that of carnal, of natural man. I mean, all of a sudden you get a brand new vehicle. You're so excited. You get to go drive that vehicle. And then two months later it's in the shop. Joy is gone. The joy that we have is so very, very different. Again, in the world sense, we, because there's temporary uh, um, reward and reinforcement, we get accustomed to following the joy of this world. And we're part of it. We're, we're, we have natural. We're part of this earth. We have, I mean, we're still carnal beings. 
But we can get so accustomed that that's the only thing that we know. So our joy is dependent on the promotion at work, on the new job, on this circumstances, on that circumstance. But listen, all that gets old. Or a phone call comes and it doesn't matter anymore. The world's joy can never actually solve problems. Problems of death, uncontrollable circumstances. It cannot solve the problem that things can happen. It can take everything away in an instant. It is fleeting. The joy of the Lord is so very very different throughout Scripture. A joy that can take place when we yet have sorrow. A joy that is completely impossible to a non-believer. It is a joy that comes from God. It is a joy that is even part of the fruit of the Spirit. A joy that is not based on circumstances, that is not based on the size of your house or the new job or the new car or our health. It is based on something that will never, ever, ever change. I will never get a call from anyone, ever, telling me the Lord is done with me. That will never happen. Lord, you'll never get that call. Well, you might. You're right. You hear me say it all the time. Life is about God. That can never change. There's, not, there's nothing that can happen in my life that can change that. Let's build from that. So this is a joy that is based on something that is permanent. It is based on something that is true, that is not delusional. It's based on God himself. It's based on unchanging promises given by the creator. I was reading in Psalm 119, separate from this. It was in the section where the psalmist was having to draw comfort because of the affliction that he was facing. And there were things that he remembered. I think it's around 52, 53, 54, 55, right around in there. And he was talking about things that he remembered, how he remembered uh, the word of God, the truth of God, and how he said, I was drawing comfort from that. I'm drawing comfort. He was able to do it. Circumstances didn't change, but he was drawing comfort from something that was not unchangeable because it was a man whose life was about God. So there was a source of joy in the midst of his sorrow that he could step back and draw from. Oh, if we could lose God and what he has done for us, oh, we could lose this joy. We'd be so miserable. So what do we rejoice in when everything falls apart in life? Or when circumstances are difficult. So what do I rejoice in? God. Him. The creator himself. The one who won't change. To allow this to draw you to focus on him more than anything else, more than any other circumstance that you're facing. To go back to the true source of joy, something that will never change. Psalm 4, 7 tells us, thou hast put gladness in my heart. John 15, 11, with the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, these things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you, that my joy might be full. Romans 14, 17, dealing with God's spirit. Now, it's not in, in meat and drink, but joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, 
This is a joy, in other words, that comes from God. The joy is a result of God himself because of who God is and what we have in him. It's one of those times where perspective is important. You know, there's a sermon I preached, I can't remember when or which one it was, but the, the way the introduction I did is coming to mind right now. Um, it was probably several years ago now, uh, I'm sure it was going through one of the books of the Bible, and I start off by reading a college letter um, from a daughter in college to her parents, and it was just horrible. Dear mom and dad, so you know, I've decided to drop out of college I've fallen in love with this boy. We're going to move in together. I mean, just disastrous. And then it like skips a space and she said, now, none of the above is true. But what is true is I have failed two classes and I need more money for college. She actually used great wisdom, didn't she? You know what she was helping her parents with? Perspective. Here the world is over. It's bad. It's not so bad. Do you understand that in God, all of our sin is done? The biggest debt we had, facing an eternal judgment from God. That will never change. Keep it in perspective. Eternity is settled. That's why the Lord told him, listen, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. If it were not so, I would have told you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Get focused on eternity. Get focused on what it's all about. When Paul said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. As he stressed, I focus on the eternal. That led to him being in a place where he could pin those words as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. This is temporary. We will have suffering. We will have trials. But we know the end. Don't discount that. Learn to use it as a source of strength, not just a simple Sunday school lesson. And it's true in everyday struggles and trials and difficult times, we can absolutely have the joy of the Lord and we need it because it is our strength. It is understanding the character of God who anchors our joy, the God who is good. Let me quote from one commentator. God is too wise to ever make a mistake. God is too loving to be unkind to his children. God is too gracious to overlook my sin. God is too merciful to allow me to be devastated. God is my protector. God is more powerful than Satan. God is more powerful than demons. God overrules all circumstances. And I belong to that God. He's my God. Is that true or not? If that's true, you know what? We can be sorrowful, yet rejoicing. Because God is sovereign and He's in control. We can rest in that. The world is out of control, but it's not out of God's control. And the Lord is amazing. Your life might have fallen to pieces. But there is no puzzle God can't put back together. Not one. Not one. Even even when you're concerned about a son and difficulties. And trials facing. A husband. We trust in the Lord. Because with God... What also goes with the fact of eternity and what is settled and how one day this is all over with and and it will all be gone. We're just at a a blip in time and the time will come when we, we step out of time. That's true. But even while we are here, there's even something more and a whole other reason to have the joy of the Lord in the midst of, uh, of suffering, to be able to rejoice evermore. Because with God, there is always hope. Always. 
We are his people. We can trust his judgments, his cause, his will for our life. Because the truth is, what God uh, deems for us is always best. Even if we don't understand it. And in that same section in Psalm, I probably need to preach that thing that's on my mind right now. In Psalm, that section in Psalm 119. It's one of the sections where you'll see him referring to God, not just in general, but as my God. Because that was, he was drawing strength from that. That psalmist was saying how, where he was drawing strength from was in his ability and his joy in the Lord to draw comfort It was a source that was there with him as a result of God's Holy Spirit. As it says in Psalm 4, that he will put gladness in your heart. That when the sorrow hits, that's what you can draw from. It's kind of like on the physical side. You know, we get a headache and we start popping pills. Well, this is your Tylenol. It's much better, though. It's when that world is falling apart. This is what you can go to. This is what you remind yourself of. As that psalmist said over and over in that chapter, I remember, I remember, I remember. Oh, and there's so much to it in Scripture, by the way, the benefits of it. The what of joy. Do you understand this, that the joy of the Lord... It helps prevent temptation from becoming too strong in your life. I think Steve and Lori with the battle of entering now, and they're strong Christians. I, there's in no way I see this taking place. But it's the joy of the Lord that helps present, prevent any bitterness from coming in. It protects you against that temptation. It protects you spiritually from covetousness, from worrying, from fretting. It wards off temptation. It encourages other Christians. I mean, when there is difficult times, and yet another sees the strength of God in your life with the joy of the Lord evident. We're not talking about a fake happiness. But where the joy of the Lord is evident, be in your strength in difficult times. Do you know what encouragement that is to others? Instead of allowing the circumstances to control you. And that in itself being such a horrible witness to others. It shows others, in God, there is hope. I believe it also attracts the sinner to Christ. I mean, seeing during difficult times the joy of the Lord in the life, the contentment in God and in His will, not the fretting, not the complaining, not the misery. It draws men to Christ. And as I finish here this evening, what to be careful of. The devil has ways of trying to come in. Obviously, he's been at this for 6,000 years of trying to steal that joy from your life. So let me cover very quickly four things, and I'll be done in five minutes with these. This is not a whole new message right now of what you have to be careful of. Let me start off with a more generic one and get more specific with the other three. I believe anything that begins to take your mind off God and you put it more on your circumstances. Anything. Now, I'm going to get more specific to build upon it. I know that's generic, but it's true. This is a battle for our thoughts, for our heart, for our will, which will lead to decisions, which will affect our demeanor. There are constant battles for your attention and the focus of your mind.
Look out for false expectations that will steal your joy. Your expectations need to stay on God. As I mentioned, there's things going to come in to try and steal your focus off the Lord. Your expectations stay on the Lord. And what I mean by that is this. It's, you put your expectations on him and what he deems best. Because those expectations will be met every time. Number two with this one. Forgetfulness, it's sort of the third one, but all, the, these three are built on the premise of that first statement I made. Forgetfulness will steal your joy. Psalm 103, one of my favorite psalms. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. Some of you can get so focused on the circumstances and the problems that you become useless in your Christian life. Want to know what your, one of your problems is? One of them? You've forgotten all the Lord's benefits. And Psalm 103 is a great place to start with his benefits, by the way. And one of those who healeth all thine diseases. And lastly, here this evening, this one will still it in a heartbeat. Self-absorption. You get so consumed with self. Boy, will that steal your joy more than anything. Self-absorption. And, and it, it, you want to get overwhelmed with circumstances and feel like you're drowning. Go there. You've got to stay focused on the Lord, not on self. I mean, you will worry about everything, the little things in your life, everything. That, that, that'll just take you. Anything that's not the way you think it should be because you're too self-absorbed. You have to trust in God where his expectations are that the Lord knows what is best and I will trust him knowing that one day this is all over with, that the biggest burden I ever had, nothing will ever compare to it. Not a call from a doctor, not any event. I don't care if I lose everything. My sin is gone as far as the east is from the west. The greatest need I had was avoiding a judgment of a holy and righteous God. And that is done. It's done. And that even pales in comparison to our own nation. It does. If we would just see what we have in God. He told those suffering Christians... The first in a series of commands. Number one, rejoice evermore. How do you do that? Knowing the joy of the Lord. Getting joy from something that will not change. God himself that will never let you down. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That will never change. Christian, if anybody in this world has a reason to be joyful, it is us. It is us who are in a place that even during difficult times and, 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 and struggles and trials, that yes, sorrow will hit, that is normal. Weeping will hit, that is normal. It's what should happen. But at the same time for us, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, where people understand that even in the difficulty, there is an anchor there. There is a hope there. There is a joy still present. Is it true or not? Is it true or not? With heads bowed and eyes closed.